I'm Jim Fix. I'm a computer scientist at Reed. Um, I've been at Reed for about 20 years or so. I, I do work in parallel algorithms. Since I was an undergraduate, I really loved this area that I that wasn't my direct PhD work, but it's programming language theory. And at Reed, I'm allowed to kind of pursue that with my students. My name is Anna Ritz. Um, I am a computer sci scientist by training, but I'm in the biology department. I've been here for about six years. This is, I think, my sixth year. Um, and so I kind of represent computational biology, the, the bridge between bio and CS. I, yeah, uh, am a computational biologist um, and all the classes I teach are within the bio department. Um, however, they all involve, they almost all involve some serious programming. So I teach an introduction to computational biology, which is kind of designed for students with no programming background. Um, but many uh, CS uh, majors and it, students interested in CS take my upper level class on computational systems biology. And that's really tied to my research where I um, work on essentially graph algorithms and graph-like algorithms and how they can be used to model biological systems. So Eitan uh, Frachtenberg is another faculty member in the department, uh, and he's been teaching our systems courses. Uh, he's just really interesting guy, a very, very amazing engineer. This is Adam Gross. Um, so he has work on database privacy. As a cryptographer, he cares about not just privacy, but uh, just public policy in general. And he's interested in things like machine learning and, and statistical reasoning. And he teaches a ethics and public policy course that you can take. It's Mark Hopkins. Uh, he's the natural language processing faculty member in the department. We have newer faculty. Uh, David Ramirez joined us from a Princeton postdoc and fellowship. He's teaching a networks course right now. Um, he generally does wire, wireless communication networks. And he's been helping with the intro courses and he's inventing an information theory and coding theory course next year. We just hired Charlie McGuffey from CMU. Um, he does something that's at the bridge between systems and algorithms. So he is very careful thinking about the structure of systems and, and the performance of, of computing systems. And specifically he looks at parallelism. What I wanted to do is just give you some food for thought about what we're all about. And I, I had this idea that it would be a little bit of a scrapbook of, of what I know about the program. The major is, is fairly new. I've been teaching computer science courses at Reed since 99, and there have been various faculty that have carried the computer science torch, but we decided to heavily invest in making it a full program in the last five or six years, I'd say. Because of the way Reed works, um, we do have a CS major. Since we grew out of math, that's just the happenstance of how we became a program. There's a very um, well used or, or followed math CS program. Lots of students do an interdisciplinary thesis that's a mix of math and CS. But then we, we just have a bunch of students uh, asking to do interdisciplinary majors uh, because of Anna, um, and just because of the immediate ties, we've had several people do CS bio, CS neuro, CS psych. But historically, we've had like CS linguistics and CS philosophy and CS physics. In fact, I, I would say personally, the way Reed seems to run its curriculum, just all the majors, is they're just trying to figure out how to get you to have a great senior year. And we gear our courses to make that possible. And one of the things we do is we talk to you really early as if you're just a peer. We do the intro courses in a way that'll get you moving quick. Um, and I think you'll see that um, in the design. This is maybe my brief chance to just show you the curriculum real quickly. We really have to rely on a kind of rigorous core that, that will make everybody in a position to do great things in all directions with either thesis or upper level courses. We have an intro course, call it CS1, and then there's a follow-up CS2. We don't assume you've programmed before and CS1 gets you up to speed, but some people have programmed a little. And so we have something that I call CS1 plus that as a half credit that you can take when you arrive. 
But then from there, we immediately take you into um, three core courses that are 300 level courses in algorithms and data structures, a thing that students call comp comp, which is a theory course, and then a systems course. And then from there, we just have a whole menu of electives. It's not a very stacked major. It's, there's a lot of breadth to it. You know, here's the entry points. Uh, and then uh, there's the core. And then there's just a ton of stuff you can take. They have different flavors. Uh, on the red stuff is kind of more systems and implementation heavy. The kind of pink stuff relies a bit on math skills and systems knowledge. And then we have more theoretical courses. Uh, we have a cryptographer who's a real expert and he teaches advanced theory courses. Um, uh, and we sometimes have mathematicians teach theory courses. Uh, there was a quantum course, quantum computation course last year. And then the way I've kind of laid this out, I, we were worried we wouldn't have like 30 faculty and there's so much to cover. And so the way we kind of geared things is we really rely heavily on you getting good math training. I think it really helps you get a leg up in the world if, if you learn the stuff in a certain way. So that's something you'll see throughout the curriculum. That it gets a little deep, you get to linear algebra, but that allows you to take a machine learning course or a computer graphics course and really be on top of the material. We regularly have students as a result of thesis or summer work with us publishing. And so a lot of students, uh, just because of the thesis experience and the, the way Reed goes for them, uh, they choose to go to graduate school. And we've had, just in the last five to six years, had success sending them to really interesting graduate work. And they do that by, you know, I'll write recommendation letters for my students to work at the end of their sophomore year, end of their junior year, for a good internship or a summer um, research program. But computer science industry is just as good as research. It's really amazing what you can do in the tech industry um, and how it can be essentially research. So we, we've had students go on to the major tech firms. Uh, we've had close connections with Apple. We have students at Google, Microsoft, Amazon. And the way that seems to work, uh, there's just alumni connections. Uh, and the way that seems to work now, there's a Center for Life Beyond Read that um, helps you kind of practice um, interviewing and um, figuring out your resume and, and make these alum or other firm connections. I wanted to give you just a sense of the department since you can't visit um, yet. So these are just the common weekly activities of the program. And a lot of it's organized by students. We have a computer science club called C-Star and um, they've convinced us to do some fun stuff, uh, trivia nights, um, puzzle nights. They also kind of look out for other things. So they helped us figure out a mentor structure for our majors. But regularly, we've always had students tutor our courses. It's a really great way to own material, meet students, and help them. Related to that, there's a, a group called STEM Gems, you know, science, technology, mathematics, um, uh, gender minorities. You guys are a nice big group, and, and so is the weekly colloquium. Speakers from either in-house or all over that come into town and talk about their work. What's funny about computer science is, you know, we just have nice machines locked in a room that you can log into and work on. Um, and then we have a place where you can get together and talk about stuff. And I'll spare you the history, but it's called New Polytopia. How do you handle students both who might come in and read the intro sequence, they might think like, well, I already did this stuff. And conversely, how do you handle students who are really interested in CS but don't have that background and might be a little intimidated? You get accepted to read, you're gonna be able to take the courses. It's just my 20 years of experience. We know how to pitch to you guys. Um, we know where you're at and we plan the curriculum to make it work for everybody. And we have a lot of things we put in place to make sure that you get the resources you need, um, including just talking to us. You, you can walk down the hall and you can walk into our offices. Our office doors are always open. So the other side of things is we do get students who come in with a lot of programming. 
either in conversation with you or I think we're putting a placement test in place. Um, you can figure out where you're at and we can find pathways for people that have seen some of the front end. But we are able to make CS1 interesting and challenging for both groups. Um, there's some clever maneuvers that I've always had to play in the way I introduce material. I would also jump in to say that um, we also have a lot of math CS majors that have taken a substantial amount of math in addition to CS to really kind of get that grounding. And there's actually a lot of CS applications all over campus yeah. that a little bit of computer science knowledge can actually like really be enriching. Students can jump into CS2 and they can skip CS2. Um, the algorithms and systems courses sometimes are taken right away by some people. Um, and we're open to making that work for people. If you could talk a little bit about why read CS or why, you know, the small liberal arts college CS um, when some of our students might also be looking at a larger research university context. Yeah. We only have, uh, you know, six faculty, seven faculty um, in CS. So you're not going to get the constant menu of choice that a large research university offers. And, and we do our best to kind of basically characterize the same breadth that, that a larger school can offer. But as a person that went to a larger school, I didn't really have access to my faculty and I didn't get to have the kinds of intense one-on-one -on -one conversations or group conversations that I regularly see students have that read either with me or, or with each other. Talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence and um, maybe ways that uh, CS might connect with neuroscience. I'd say in the last couple of years, um, Mark has really kind of pioneered the artificial intelligence and deep learning courses um, here at Reed. And he has, has really kind of, in addition to his natural language processing, like kind of main research area has really, you know, explored working in computational biology and neuroscience. There's other neuroscience research that right now is actually needing a lot of computational hands. So I can see that being a really great entry point kind of for students in the, in the future. What programming language are courses primarily taught in? When I'm teaching my courses, I kind of have people learn one or several. So uh, this semester um, in my parallelism and concurrency class, I had people learn Go. They knew some C and C++, but I'm teaching them CUDA and I'm also teaching them POSIX threads within C++ and C. Certainly when I'm teaching intro, I wear different programming language hats and I teach Python in when there's a certain style of structuring code, I'll teach it in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of some other language and I'll tell people what language I'm teaching, but it happens to be in Python.